system despite efforts to create a better society too many people including youth women people with disabilities have been left behind and able to benefit from the economic human and technological advancement it's against this background that we ask ourselves what is the role of government in building an inclusive food system to address this question ntv starting now brings you a live talk show with the big question mark my name is priscilla regina naloga Once again, welcome to this live talk show. I am Priscilla Regina Naroga, your host. Special thanks to Hunger Project Uganda, Right to Grow, and Touch the Heart Uganda for their combined efforts to help us address the big question which embeds our discussion this evening. What is the role of government in building inclusive food system? Allow me to introduce our discussants this evening. We are joined by Honorable Flavia. Kabahenda, who's the Parliamentary Alliance on Food and Nutrition Security, and she's here to represent the legislators and government. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Christine. I want to really take this opportunity to greet everybody out there. Thank you for watching us, and please join us in the discussion, because food is for us, and we are for food. Okay, that's an interesting tagline. The hashtag is World Food Day 2022 on our social media platforms as you follow the conversation. Next to her is Honorable Fiona Nyamutoro, who is the National Female Youth Member. Good afternoon to you, Honorable. Good afternoon, Christine. Thank you for having us. We are here to all our viewers and uh, all those that are catching the conversation online to start a very important discussion that I think over time has been neglected by very many key stakeholders, and yet it is the center of human existence. It is the reason as to why we would have human beings being healthy tomorrow and able to utilize their energies for development. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Priscilla is the name. <laughs> okay. Priscilla. Then we're also joined Sorry. by Mr. Gerald Kato, who is the Right to Grow Country product, uh, Program Coordinator for Hunger Project Uganda. You're most welcome, Mr. Kato. Thank you, Priscilla. My name is Gerald Kato. I'm very glad uh, to join the rest of the other actors <coughs> to commemorate World Food Day. But more so uh, to have this discussion in Uganda, we have just been experiencing severe hunger crisis. Thank you. Okay, all right. Now, as we have this conversation, I just want to share some statistics with you and help you see the picture that we are facing with in terms of food insecurity in Uganda. Back in 2020, 3.1 billion people, million people could not afford a healthy diet due to the inflation of food prices. And we all know the backbone of that, COVID-19, and then the Russia-Ukraine war came forth, and so many things have been affected. And that inflation has come down to the fuel food insecurity. The gender gap in food insecurity is also widening. In 2021, 31.9% of women in the world were moderately or severely food insecure compared to the 27.6% of men. Still statistically, in 2021, an estimated 29.3% of the global population, 2.3 billion people to be exact, were severely or moderately food insecure and were facing severe food insecurity. Globally, in 2020, while the whole world was shut down because of COVID-19, an estimation of 22% of children under five years of age who were stunned, 6.7% were wasted, and 5.7% were overweight. 
Now that's the backbone of the conversations that we're going to be having around food insecurity and what government, but also the private sector and individual stakeholders can do. So it's upon this background that I'll start with Honorable Flavia. Uh, what is the picture you see of the food insecurity currently in Uganda? You see, uh, you cannot stop rain from falling into your house if the house was leaking. So when we talk about Ukraine and COVID, they already found a leaking house. That was rain. And so I think we need to get back to the house and look at whether we had any plans as a government, any plans as a household, to address the food insecurity, right from household up to the, 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 the country and, 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 and uh, the whole community called Uganda. And the people of Uganda have struggled with hunger from time immemorial. And even when the, 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 it is said that the poverty levels are reducing, but people are continuing to be hungry. I don't know how hunger could not be related to poverty, that even the levels would, would carry the hunger aspect in the poverty levels. Mm -hmm. And then the production of food has become a problem for very many reasons because of a, a number of uh, uh, aspects that I will try to elaborate. The growing population did not come by COVID alone. We already had a very, gro a very g fast growing population as a country, which we couldn't manage, we couldn't contain. Secondly, uh, the land spaces, the land, our, our land tenure system also exacerbated the problem of food because we have no planning, we have no physical plans. So every land is for real estate. There is no land for agriculture that is demarcated by government that this one will be left for doing agriculture, demonstration, farms, and production. So everybody is left to use their land the way they want. And then the third thing is for us to move away from our traditional farming practices to simply get onto the modern farming, farming practices to even exclude the nutritious food and go for foods which will work as only cash crops and <coughs> food crops, including maize, because each region in Uganda was known for its unique food items as staple food. And these were very nutritious foods. I loved the north and the, the northeast for their for their for their grains, for their seed for their vegetables, which were very rich, that even a woman who was weaning her child would only use that and they would not even need milk. Okay. I well, loved my, my, my Western place for its millet. And so I think we cannot now sit here and blame it on Ukraine and blame it on COVID when actually the systems were broken, that the production levels in food are going down and that the food we seem to be producing is not nutritious. We are only eating to live and not eating nutritious food. No wonder our labor productivity index is very low because people are not eating. Even those who are eating are only eating to live but not energy giving food that, that would give them the, 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 the amount of energy needed for them to do production. Okay. That is why the theme says better production will give us better nutrition mm -hmm. and better lives. All right. Okay, let's turn to Honorable Fiona. In all of these, uh, we do have Honorable Flavia mentioning tradition. Tradition has changed. Back in the day, homesteads had farms, they had gardens, and that means that uh, they would be assured of food on a daily basis. So hunger was not really an issue back in the day. But because of the uh, socioeconomic developments, we are seeing homesteads today that do not have the backbone of gardening. Therefore, hand to mouth has become more difficult, especially for the youth. Now, in respect of uh, the youth regarding food insecurity, uh, what would be your say? Society has evolved a lot over time. I am not old enough to tell the stories of our forefathers, but we do have some leaves that we keep borrowing from. Back in the day, every homestead had a granary, mm. for instance, in my region where I came from. So there was no such a thing as worry of food insecurity. But also, the rudimentary tools and methods that they used for agriculture were protective enough of the environment, first of all, and then also of the nutritious substances that they needed to get out of food. During my, my grandmother's time, food 
was even used as medicine. True. But now food is a disease. <laughs> you eat something today and you have a bacterial infection. I, I will be but honest with you. Nowadays I'm very sensitive, food food especially food. for <laughs> Irish potatoes. If I see a dark thing, like I'm not going to eat all of those potatoes. <laughs> like, it is hard to explain to someone that the rate of bacterial infections is very high right now in our generation. Mm -hmm. And they can barely even trace the right treatment to it. They will try to tag us to very many antibiotics and so. But also, the role of capitalism in all this mm -hmm. cannot be neglected. Agriculture is specifically now in a commercial lens. Young people, first of all, associate agriculture and food growing to poverty because of uh, the continuous price fluctuations of food products. It is very hard to convince the youth to get involved in agriculture unless it is particularly minting a particular price during a season. Seasons have changed over time. Today you wake up and farmers are not even sure when they are supposed to start planting or not. And I think this has affected the food chain aggressively and also the population. There is not a time that we woke up to the realization of how important food is than COVID-19. COVID-19 was when everyone realized that food is actually the reason for our existence. Whoever knew that a country like Uganda, where the backbone is agriculture, would fall short of supply. I mean, we are the ones who are always supposed to be giving our neighbors surplus. But the reverse is true today. So we are in a very unfortunate situation, and we need to get very intentional and deliberate about the way forward. We need to have the future secured by <coughs> involving young people at the center, first of all. When we talk about nutrition, we need people to understand that it is only with a healthy body that you can be able to plan and have a better tomorrow. It is not just about feeding to survive. Yeah. It has reached to that point where it is so bad, like the cases in Karamoja, a hunger crisis where somebody just has to put in something in their stomach to live to see the day of tomorrow. But we should never get there as a country. I think Uganda can do better. Government can come up with a, a better conducive environment that does not just favor farmers, but all citizens. We should all have stakeholder promotion and inclusiveness in seeing that our food chain is not disrupted in any way. All right, thank you so much, Honorable. Now the conducive environment is there, but maybe uh, the likes of the Hunger Project Uganda may not so much agree uh, to the extent that they've had to do extra work to ensure uh, that the children of Uganda have a better livelihood, especially through the voice of nutrition. Now turning to you, Mr. Kato, uh, when we talk about the nutrition and given the backbone of uh, what the honorables have shared where do you come as the hunger project uganda to actually say this is the exact problem and we have solved it this way and these are the results that we have seen over time yeah thanks so much uh, priscilla uh, you gave a very good uh, preamble by giving the data but uh, i want to emphasize uh, the point of malnutrition or stunting because as right to grow program that's our main focus to reduce stunting uh, among children below five years uh, uganda has made progress in two in two in 2000 a prevalency of stunting was at 45 percent by 2016 it dropped to 29 percent but even with such kind of progress we have seen uh, um, uh, malnutrition in all its forms, remain a very huge uh, challenge uh, uh, in development. But also, we know uh, uh, even before stunting, hunger has been a major issue. And a couple of drivers. But uh, what is important is the fact that um, just last year, we had the, the National Food Systems Summit. And uh, we had a lot of uh, conversations around the food systems. And I remember at the end of it all, we had a very huge event at Kololo that the president of this country came and officiated. And uh, 
when you listen, you would see a lot of commitment and political talk in embracing uh, the food systems approach in addressing issues of hunger and malnutrition. But uh, beyond that, we have not seen much being done by government. And, and we do have representation from government here, Honorable Flavia. Uh, why does Mr. Tato stand on, sit on the other side and say that they've not seen much? All they've had is political talk over that. I think the very first thing that we need to know is where to place the food and nutrition aspect in government. Because there has been a fight between education, health, and prime minister's office on whether food and nutrition should be which sector. And that alone can make it an orphan that even in the discussions of development, food and nutrition may not come around. And I want to tell you that uh, the realities we see now, for instance, how many children go to school here in Uganda on empty stomachs? And then we continue to teach. And then we expect them to have carried lunch even when they came on empty stomachs. And this is a whole business case that government needs to invest in so that they come up with the financing of food and nutrition. Two, the discussion is, is what is not coming up, even when it is in the prime minister's office. Prime minister's office is overwhelmed with disasters, with reliefs, with everything, until the discussion on food and nutrition is not held anywhere. And so I want to agree with, with Qatar that indeed I think government assumed that uh, people in the homes are producing food when actually they are no longer producing food. Actually, what is happening that is very overwhelming is in my district, for instance, and I know it could be happening in the other rural districts. And what district is that? Chegegwa district. Mm -hmm. People have plantations of matoke, but the people from Kampala who are middlemen come and they pay off the produce with a loan of 10 million up front. And so every bunch of matoke that comes about, they pick it for the market. They, they, w when the, the, the maize is about to get ready, they pay the whole field. And then this person is a slave on a field where he's the one who planted, is the owner of the land. But because he has this money, which money won't even last, now most of the homes are now uh, living on the shops. Okay. One kilogram a, a day. And so I want to really join the campaign with Qatar to implore government to come up with the food and nutrition policy. So before we get to the food and nutrition policy, uh, Gerald, you are still referring to this subject in the form of malnutrition and yes. how it's affecting the younger generation. Yes. And maybe again, I want to add that um, today, 54% uh, of adults in Uganda have suffered malnutrition. Yeah. And we know as you suffer malnutrition, you don't live to your full potential. You know. But quickly to add on, on what Fraser was mentioning about school feeding. School feeding has been organized as one of the game changers. Sure. For one, addressing food systems, but also for addressing issues of uh, hunger generally. And I want to give just quick um, uh, statistics. Uh, apparently, between the, uh, around 46.3 percent of our children are the only ones getting food between 6 to 12 years during the day. The others are not uh, able to eat food. So this means that um, we are running... And this is not considering that either they're having a balanced diet or uh, uh, not. No, just, just something food. to eat, yes. So this means that uh, we have over 50 percent of our school-going children who are not able to eat anything at all during the day. And as young as six years, as young as seven years, that should be uh, a very big problem. But also to add on that, if you look at uh, government investment to agriculture mm -hmm. sector, which is a sector uh, uh, that should be guiding us <coughs> increase, to increase our production as a country, it has not been, it has not been uh, good enough. In 2003, government of Uganda, during the uh, uh, um, Malabo, you know, it committed to commit 10% of our annual budget to agriculture. But 18 years down the road, government has been spending averagely around 3 to 
Now, if you don't invest in the sector like agriculture, which is your minister of the economy, what do you expect? I like when she says the, uh, uh, the rain got uh, a leaking got, house. Got a leaking house. Exactly. So if you don't invest enough in the sector, that really is your mainstay, mm -hmm. what do we expect? You know, so we have talked, the people are talking, we need a good inclusive food system, but I think it's, it's high time government, you know, becomes more responsive and uh, prioritizes agriculture. Okay. I would like to pick a comment uh, from Honorable Fiona. Uh, I, I believe this was a government intervention, introduction of milk in schools. Um, what is the backbone of that? And uh, how is it supposed to go a long way in addressing the food insecurity, the malnutrition in our children? In addressing malnutrition in the children, absolutely. Because uh, milk is uh, very multinutritional in its intake. And I think it was uh, addressed, it was identified as one of the challenges that we were having. If you were to promote universal education under the assumption that every Ugandan citizen should have the ability to access a free quality education, it doesn't make a lot of sense for those who cannot afford to pay for the education to go to school and they are hungry at the end of the day. The input that you expect from the, city, from the students themselves would not be viable. So adding uh, milk on their diet is a plus, definitely. <laughs> the idea initially was not just milk. It was milk and eggs. How affordable that is for government to implement is a question for another day. Right now it's hard. The chicken farms have closed uh, simply because of the concentrate having been taxed. Now it's a bit expensive for those that are involved in the poultry farming to but ensure ideally, sustainability. Ideally, though, it is... Uh, it is, it is uh, one thing that we should applaud and push for, because if it is realized, it is uh, a great push towards the discussion we are having now, bettering the nutrition of children. You see, the effects of stunting, especially right from an infant stage, are, irre are irreversible. Yeah. Once a child is stunted, that is it for life. Their, their growth is affected, their potential mm. is... Yeah. Uh, aggravated backwards mm -hmm. it is so bad that you would never imagine and uh, uh, this is not anything against people's personal human heights but you look at a child not growing and you assume they are naturally short and yet it is actually an effect of stunting but also the child mortality rate mm -hmm. has to be addressed in that sense we are losing very many children statistics that are never mentioned about these are things that everyone skips when discussing matters of development, and yet it is the core of development. Mm -hmm. The best definition I have ever found of development is development is human development. Sure. You need people to survive first right. before you can have them better their livelihoods, better the services around them, and that starts with what what, with what nurtures their growth, mm -hmm. and that is the food that we are talking about here. Okay, all right. Gerald, what challenges have you found in doing the kind of work that you're doing? Um, one big problem has been the uh, legal policy and institution framework of government to coordinate issues of um, uh, 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 nutrition. Uh, I think in 2019, 2018-2019, government asked all MDAs to invest in, uh, to, 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 to allocate, to, to plan and allocate budgets for nutrition specific and nutrition sensitive interventions. Uh, around seven MDAs, ministries and agencies that have direct linkage with, with nutrition. But uh, since then, we have not been, we have not seen a clear uh, legal or policy regime to follow up and know how much has Ministry of Education invested in addressing issues of uh, malnutrition? How much is Ministry of Agriculture investing? How much is the Ministry of Health investing? And water and the others. And that has been a very big problem. It becomes very difficult to hold government accountable without having clear information mm -hmm. how much money 
in real terms has been allocated. That has been uh, one problem. But the other bigger thing is, um, like you know, Priscilla, we have uh, a younger population. And also our, our, uh, our, 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 our young people have not been properly, um, in essence, we have not leveraged the demographic dividend to have younger people into the farming sector, you know, for a number of reasons. But mainly, um, uh, I think the issues of land, land ownership. Most young people don't have land. And yet we are talking of over 50% of our population being below 15 years. Over 77 below 30 years. And yet, an average farmer in Uganda is 50 years. You see? So this means that um, uh, where we have 600 southern uh, youth requiring jobs per year and nothing being done, it means that uh, we have a lot of young people who have potential to drive even you know, technology, not having chance, opportunities to get involved in the farming sector. And yet this year's theme is saying, uh, uh, leaving no one behind. You know. So to me, I think uh, it's, it's, it's high time mm -hmm. as government, and I'm happy Honorable Nyamutori is here, we need to get away how do we bring the younger people, the youth, into the food system. Okay, all right, that's a question that we're going to return back with and also uh, asking ourselves, is the PDM in any way aiding uh, the solution of inclusion of the youth into the conversation of food security in Uganda? We're going to be taking a short breather, we return, and as we return, we have to think about the food and nutrition policy and what it can actually encompass to create a better Uganda for us all. Again, one, you, thank you so much for staying with us on NTV as we get to address the food insecurity ahead of the World Food Day, which is on the 16th of October 2022. And the theme is leave no one behind. That means the old shouldn't be left behind, the young shouldn't be left behind, the children shouldn't be left behind. But it all comes down to the hands of the policy makers uh, to have the responsibility. Therefore, we ask ourselves what is the role of government in building an inclusive food system. My name is Priscilla Regina Naroga and of course on my panel I do have Honorable Flavia and then also Honorable Fiona and Mr. Gerald. Now uh, we left off into the break with a question that Gerald had presented to you Honorable Fiona in mm -hmm. regards to your youth direct active inclusion in the food system and the value chain. Yeah. Young people uh, getting involved in the food uh, chain and food systems in general is a very fundamental call that we all need to heed to as leaders. And how do we go about this? There are very many uh, strategies that we can put in place to have the youth at the center of the food chain and to have sustainability of it. To start off with the pricing of agriculture products. Can government, through Ministry of Agriculture, through all its planning agencies, be able to secure a sustainable pricing at a minimum wage level of agricultural products. That is one thing that is going to attract young people to the sector. Because we are not going to have young people encouraged into agriculture. Many of them have tried it. And then at the end of the day, there is no market for their produce. Or before they could reach their products to the market, being perishable goods. They are either spoiled, rotten, or even lost because of poor infrastructure or another. Secondly, can we have uh, young people as, at the helm as agents of climate change? One of the reasons as to why we are discussing an affected food system today are the adverse effects of climate change. Mm -hmm. The environment is affected. And guess who has the best, the biggest numbers and who is destroying the environment? The young people. Through poor disposal, through uh, careless handling of our communities and societies around, there is also need for deliberate sensitization on nutrition, especially among the young people. These discussions that we are having here today seem basic and simple when someone mentions them, but they are actually far-stretched. It, it goes as far as from the day a woman conceives a child. How many pregnant mothers can access a balanced diet? 
and with the high rate of teenage pregnancies that we've been having in the country since COVID-19, mm -hmm. you can imagine how many infants have been born mm -hmm. when they are already deficient of, of very many nutritional substances. Mind development is uh, affected, the growth of that citizen is affected, our whole future as a country is at doom. But also, we need to promote the right farming strategies. Can we have better promotion and activation of mixed farming? Back in the day, it was particularly subsistence farming. Ugandans were driven away from subsistence to commercial. Now we are crying the effects of neglecting subsistence totally. Can we have mixed farming? Can we have young people involved in both the subsistence to sustain the livelihoods, but also have the commercial bit of it achieved? And then lastly, we need particular investment in research to protect our, our food content, our natural food content as a country. Uganda is a country that I have never seen across the globe. Any other community that has more food variety than us for the less countries that I have traveled. Mm -hmm. But we have evolved over it and embraced it in utilization of wastage. You will go to a Ugandan party or even just a colleague or family hosting you for a meal and there will be 18 meals, 18 different courses to be served. I mean, we, we are a rich country in <laughs> diverse <laughs> terms of food. In that so sense, you can't the generosity the can be yeah. promoted, but like we said, this discussion on nutrition has to be intentional. Okay. Can we get to that point of where, even if you are having a meal as a family, do you know what you have on table? Do you know that I need a bit of protein, I need a bit of carbohydrate, I need a bit of this, and maybe this is too much of this, or is the table full of only protein? Is the table full of only carbohydrate? And how is that going to promote our betterment as human beings, as Ugandans, and as a people? All right, thank you so much, Honorable Fiona. Uh, interesting to note, uh, one of the things that I pick out from uh, your submission is research and the importance of it. But then again, government seems to be doing a good job ignoring it because it requires a lot of money to mm -hmm. invest it in does. research. Um, I had a conversation with uh, a research team from Macquarie University uh, in the nematology department, and they were talking about how they had been to different research institutes here in Uganda, uh, Namulonge, among other research institutes. And uh, they tried to carry out research but when they carried out the research and wanted to share the results thereof, um, sort of some form of corruption came in <laughs> to stop them from sharing that research, making it go public so that they can have uh, improvement in the quality, therefore the quantity of food security in the country. So again, it also comes back to climate change. Now I'll turn to you, Honorable Flavia. Uh, yeah. Climate change, we must address this because I, it's I a crisis in safeguarding food. Me, I want to go back and pick from Fiona and then come to the climate change. When we talk about the young people, we are talking about young right from home. And what I've kn known time over, being a teacher, is that in most cases, we start introducing young people to virtues and values, even when it is not their intent. They appreciate it as they go along. You even introduce this young person to a school, an ECD, and every morning it will be crying as you take it to school. But along the way, he starts understanding that I think this is for, is for my good. And then they go appreciating it. That is the reason why when we were still young and in primary school, we had wildlife clubs. And they were meant, and environment clubs. They were meant to inculcate in us an idea of protecting our environment. And we didn't know what we were doing because they would come as play, they would come as games, you would go with, with the club and you, tr you, you are taken to Queen and you are taken to where to, to just, but it was supposed to inculcate in us an idea of climate change, conservation, and loving wildlife and, and, and environment. And uh, that is why we even had school gardens. School gardens were not for fun, they were supposed to teach the young people to love agriculture. Until recently, when agriculture started being punishment, 
<laughs> the young people <laughs> have true. looked at it as punishment. <laughs> but yeah. oh, in the old times, uh, 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 allow me to interject. It was not in fun. private school, yes. it's, it's actually punishment. Mm. The, the garden is there, yes. but the garden is to supply for, for, the for kitchen punishment. with food. Mm. However, the children interact with the garden as punishment. Yes. Yet, uh, the public schools that I, I went to, yes. uh, or the traditional schools that I went to, we had a farm, and agriculture was not just a subject, but it was a practical. Yes. On mm. your rotor, you yes. had a day where but you'll go to the farm and then you'll <laughs> get the eggs. You'll go to the farm, you'll dig, you'll go to the farm, you'll milk. And that practicability actually helped us appreciate it did. agriculture. It did. And in now any it case, is just it was even incentivized and and yeah. to the extent that at the end of the term, you would have a party. Sometimes to even eat from your proceeds. Mm -hmm. And so it was that lovely. But today they have uh, demonized it. And so the young people have put it aside. Secondly, I mean, I was honorary, but it's not going to uh, help me trend on TikTok. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, no, unless you're going to uh, make it cool in yeah. a way. So and now, people mm, slay farmers. Slay farmers. <laughs> Again, our, yeah. our school system that has the child at school from 6 in the morning up to 6 in the evening, no weekend, no holiday. So you can't have a child in a boarding school from 3 years up to university. They don't interact with land. They don't interact with any plant. For them, they interact only in class. And you expect us to tell this young person of 25 years who is graduating at a university that now please go and start digging. Therefore, Fyodor's policies will fall to a dead end. Oh, yes. So okay. we need, I think, to get back to giving these young people bits of introductions of the, the, the areas in the food system mm -hmm. and activities as play. I went to Mauritius mm. and I went to a P2 class and I found this teacher who was teaching mathematics but in the garden mm. because he had told every child to plant a bean in three pots. One pot, don't put water, simply put sand. Another pot, put water and sand. Another pot, cover it so that it doesn't see light. And then after this, he would come with a ruler. Each child was supposed to have a ruler. Can you measure the length of the root? Wow. And then they would measure the length, tell me how many centimeters, and then they say centimeters of the root, centimeters of the, 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 the bean tree. And you know, he was teaching mathematics, but with soil on their hands. And he was making it so interesting, and everybody was looking after their pots with, with, with very, very. So it wouldn't be difficult that for that child to grow up and be interested in These are my beans, and the one who planted them, hands on farming. Hands yes. on farming. Yeah. And so we so need, we need to another really revision make of it our curriculum. revision of our curriculum mm. to include agriculture because we can't do away with it. It is our backbone. Mm. That, that's tough. They've already revised it, so we might have to wait another 10 years. I mean, so the revision. And, and is no, we can't uh, revise continuous. because the Public Finance Management Act is. Mm -hmm reviewed every year yeah so we can review any policy every year okay. and uh, if, if it requires that and uh, the next thing is that close to 60 percent of the utilizable land for agriculture that we have in the country belongs to older persons that speaks a lot about the young people because the young people are asking themselves if if i planted these trees here Muzei has not yet given me the land. He's still holding if it. If you ask Muzei's land, he will if tell you, you want Muzei's to kill land, me, my child. Saying, now mm. what do you want? Everybody will be up in arms. Yes. And so the young people having no land to own so that they can love this land and, 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 and try to interact with their land and put a few plants would be the right thing to do. So we need to talk about this kind of land ownership and how the older persons we hold intergenerational discussions mm. to ensure that the older persons can not only transfer the land, but to start allowing the young people to use the land as long as it can be utilized well. Just so on the subject matter, it's the again, land. it's a long <laughs> conversation, but let's <coughs> first uh, then pick a leaf from the climate change uh, crisis that are affecting the food security in Uganda. Sure. Yes, the climate change, I already alluded to the fact that in school we had wildlife clubs, we had environmental clubs, and these were meant to inculcate in us a sense of, of, of the environment protection. But government needs to also invest in water, in early warning systems, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to invest in, uh, in, 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 in ensuring that the, the land fragmentation issue is addressed, uh, to ensure that uh, the policies 
uh, finance, the public financing re reflects government's will or political will yeah. to, uh, to, to make sure that in the system everybody is involved, included, and in any case, I love it when the president continues to say value addition. I don't know at what point does he think value addition starts. Because for us who have interacted with agriculture, we know that value addition starts from the soil. Testing the soil on which you are going to plant, planting the right seed, planting in the right way, and up to the end, up to the time when someone wants to process coffee, up to the end when someone wants to process w w cocoa. But here, there is a very, very strong and comprehensive value addition mechanism, even at post-harvest handling. Okay. If the whole government cannot own granaries, mm. granaries or reserves of food, and all we could do during COVID was to beg from the citizenry that give us some food, then I think it's a shame. We need as a government in the policy to have food reserves okay. in case of any shocks that may come our way. And they have started coming. Uh, after as COVID as, as we wait for policies, of course, there will demand for financing. Now, I'll turn to you, Gerald, in terms of uh, food resilience in relation to climate change. I know that you do have banks across 12 districts providing storage for excess harvest and ensuring that food security is available on and off season. And in regards to climate financing with relation to food resilience. How easy has it come for you to do that uh, in mitigating the challenges we're talking about? Uh, maybe to emphasize also the point of climate change. Apparently, climate change is a global phenomenon, sure. but also it's one of the drivers of uh, the food or hunger crisis that we are facing today. And I think in Uganda, we have seen, we have experienced double burden. When it rains, it rains too much, <laughs> and it causes the uh, floods. Actual people die. When it doesn't rain, it's so dry, and it causes drought. Cows, animals die because of hunger. You know, but also at the center of climate change, there are um, people, especially um, marginalized persons, who are seen or organized to be some of the drivers of climate change, uh, you know, issues like they look for trees or firewood to, to, cook, to cook a meal. And uh, because of that, I feel uh, it's important for government to really invest significantly to address issues of climate change, but also uh, build uh, uh, resilience or build systems that build resilience in farming communities. As the Hunger Project, um, we have uh, we adopted a model called the farmer field schools yes. you know where farmers come and learn good farming practices you know jointly together from each other from each other yes. you know and uh, you know there's a lot of a lot of a lot of knowledge there's a lot of local knowledge among our farmers mm. in, even in regards to um, uh, uh, you know promoting agroecological farming how to grow food or how to produce food without necessarily using pesticides. Mm. But what has lacked has been a system that mobilizes that kind of knowledge but also it, uh, uh, and also ensures that knowledge is utilized. It, it, it and this would come through strongly through the agriculture extensional uh, policy, which somehow has not seen the light yet. But broadly, uh, to answer you, it's very important to invest in smallholder farmers if we are equally able to address issues of climate change. Because smallholder farmers are very critical in the food systems, including building uh, resilient farming systems. Okay, all right. Uh, I feel like what you have submitted in the program, one of the programs that you run, it's, it's as easy as government's just picking up on that pilot and extend it to national level. Mm -hmm. uh, I think policy sh is, is that easy because there's already private sector that is aiding to show you that it's possible on a smaller mm -hmm. scale. And if invested in or focused on in terms of law, uh, lawmakers and policy makers, then it would be easy to roll out on a national level. Which then begs the question, in terms of advocacy for food security and nutrition, what are the integrated methods that you have adopted in ensuring that uh, you try to bridge that gap leaving no one behind between nutrition and food security gerald <coughs> uh, i mean the whole point is really about the legal framework mm. 
Because when you have a policy environment that uh, promotes uh, a system, then things fall in place. Mm -hmm. But uh, since 2009, we've had the Food and Nutrition uh, uh, Bill pending up to now, many years later. You know, and you wonder where is the interest of government? Where, where is the mandate of government in feeding its people? So to me, I think one is to have uh, an effective policy regime, and then we can be able to mobilize every actor to, to take part. But also I want to also commend government. Um, last year when we had the food systems dialogues, you know, everybody took part in the conversations. Priscilla, you will find a food vendor in Owino or in Kalerwe has her own understanding and also inspiration for a food system that works for her. You know, but also an agriculture food dealer in Iruero has their own vision on and inspirations for a functional food system. Mm -hmm. But equally, an old woman, you know, in Ibulisa also has, you know, what they want to see happen. So to me, it's, it's very important to, to promote inclusion, have different voices, but most importantly, the private sector to be involved in the advancing an effective food system. Okay. Horrible Flavia, yes. it comes back down to you. Because <laughs> earlier we had been informed that uh, there's a battle on ownership and pest setting. Ministry mm -hmm. of Health wants to pest set it. Ministry of Education wants to pest set it. You do have uh, the Office of the Prime Minister also wanting to pest set it. Yet it sounds like Agricultural Ministry would also want to pest set it. And all this uh, hula bala is causing a, a food and nutrition bill to be seated to be on the fun. shelves and get dusted year in, year out. How do we go forward, especially with that bill? I think going forward is that we as members of parliament are going to continue to bring this as a matter of national concern until government is ready to see the, the, the and appreciate it. And I would like to appreciate when the, uh, the right honorable prime minister came up with the milk issue although the affordability was another one. Mm -hmm. Because if the children are coming uh, from home when they are hungry, if these children cannot even pack food, when you tell them to pay 10,000 for milk, even if, food, even if milk was a requirement, what are you trying to tell us? That now school is becoming unaffordable as well to the hungry children? I think we need to start touching reality and seeing what can be done, because I know that up to now, it seems Ministry of Finance and Government has not yet appreciated that investing in the people has a return on investment. Yeah. I think we need that clear business case yeah. to present it to them. Ministry of Finance needs to be presented. The one dollar you invest will bring these many dollars yeah. so that they can learn to say, okay, the trickle-down effect is good. Because with the statistics that are telling us that 54% of our population is people under 18. Mm -hmm. okay. The labor productivity index is at 31%, meaning we have so many people in Uganda, but they, they are not productive. Why? Redundant. They are Redundant. hungry. Mm -hmm. They are hungry. And so they can't produce, even on the table, even behind the desks. Yeah. The productivity and the is, for working the is hunger. Is hunger. Mm. Yeah. So okay. now the, the, it is at this time that the National Planning Authority needs to really touch ground and understand this reality. But at the same time, I would like to call on the development partners to develop this business case. What right. is the cost okay. benefit analysis in if we invested in food and nutrition? If we had a school feeding policy, yes. if we had early warning systems, if we had uh, an address to the land. Flavia, you're, you're giving so many ifs. And so, I mean, <laughs> but yes. uh, we have run out of time. So that, so that yes. Ministry of mm. Finance, mm. at those calculations, mm. will now say, okay, I think we can invest this much. Okay. Because as of now, they think it is a consumptive for us to talk about food. They assume food should be produced at home. But Let, at let home me turn to Gerald. In the closing remarks, leaving no one behind, how do we intend to achieve that in the presence of all these challenges? <coughs> By having this kind of conversation, eh? when you have uh, an MP representing uh, females in the country, Youth. she's no. their voice. Youth. 
uh, you know, I mean, uh, young youth, people. you know, she's, she's <laughs> young females, she's, she's, she's their voice. And uh, the thinking is um, the aspirations, their vision is getting amplified through such kind of representation. Um, but the other bit is that uh, all of us should recognize that we can do something. Sure. In our own small literal ways, we can do something to make, uh, uh, to create, to contribute, to create a food system that works for all of us. Okay, all right. And then Honorable Fiona, in your closing remarks? I think we, we need to reach a level of consciousness where every citizen appreciates that our food intake is uh, directly linked to our health and existence of tomorrow. So the earlier we have people passionately take on the fight to promote nutrition, for better healthy citizens, the better for us as a country. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for enlightening us and providing an answer. And I guess uh, the answer is within the conversations that we have had. Some of these policies are already there. They're just on the shelf, uh, waiting for government to pull them out and off the shelf, put them on the floor, and then implement them actively. But at the end of the day, regarding the, for the, the theme ahead of World Food Day, leaving no one behind, better production, uh, which leads to better nutrition. At the end of the day, you're looking at a better life. Promoting sustainable farming practice practices will go a long way, in including everyone and leaving no one behind. Techniques to sustainably improve the crop yield that we do have currently on the market. Let's talk about the climate change resilience. We've got to promote that and echo it day in, day out, so that you can have resilient communities that can cope with the environmental changes uh, that are being faced in their different localities. And, of course, developing e uh, income-generating activities that can promote uh, people to have food on the table so that they're not working for hand-to-mouth but they're eating, they're nutritious, and they're working for a better Uganda. And as Honorable Flavia rightly put it, investing in people has a huge return on investment. And that is our plea to the government. If you can have that at the back of your mind, that when you invest in these Ugandans, create the enabling environments, uh, put out the policies, the food and nutrition policy will go a long way in mitigating the food security challenges in Uganda. And it will be a good return on investment. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure being in your company. And I trust that this conversation has been enlightful. Priscilla, Regina, Naloga, good evening.